Hello students, this is your professor Elena Koch again and this video is meant to introduce you to literary realism. This is the first of the three major movements we'll be studying this semester and it's, uh, it's a big movement it's in terms of its importance in establishing foundations for American literature that comes later. Uh, if you haven't already seen it, there is a handout under content for week one called um, Realism Video Notes. Uh, I'd encourage you to download that and take notes on it as we go through uh, this little video so that you can um, get a firmer grasp on the material. Okay, so before we look at realism, I want to just take a quick look at what came before it so that you can understand how realism is different. The literary period before the Civil War was Romanticism, both in America and in Britain. And uh, in this literature, uh, we see generally a lot of improbable plots. In other words, unusual, strange things happen, such as in Frankenstein, a man making a creature out of dead body parts. These novels uh, were often set in faraway places and in faraway times. For example, The Scarlet Letter by Hawthorne was set 200 years uh, previous to when it was written. Often the language was very heightened, so if you've read a romantic novel, you know it takes a little while to get the feel of it. Uh, the romantics privileged imagination, intuition, emotion, um, those things rather than logic and reason, which they thought was rather cold. And that it also indivi uh, idealized individuals, the romantic hero, is a type that we see in a lot of this literature. Okay, this brings us to realism. Um, after the Civil War, we see some conditions economically and socially that allow for the growth of the novel. For example, increasing literacy. More and more Americans are learning how to read. We see the uh, rise of urban uh, places, rise of cities, industrial expansion, which therefore created the rise of middle-class comforts. So, for example, uh, middle-class women no longer had to make their own soap. They could go out and buy soap, which opened up more leisure time for them to read. All of these things, um, all of these economic conditions meant that there was a wider audience for literature and more people to write it as well. In addition, we have the social change that comes after the Civil War, so the end of slavery means that we now have millions of African Americans who are finding a place for themselves in American history, a new place for themselves. Um, and uh, there are a great number of questions about the role of race. Um, there are struggles with uh, racism and white supremacy and segregation and reconstruction. Um, there are also questions about the role of women. Uh, as women had been uh, traditionally relegated to the home, to the private sphere, more and more of them wanted to speak out and uh, enter into the public sphere. Okay, so this brings us to realism. At the top of your outline, um, your handout, uh, you will see three definitions, and here's the first one uh, from William Dean Howells, himself a novelist. He said that realism is nothing more and nothing less than the truthful treatment of material. And that you probably have guessed, right? When we say that a movie is realistic or a TV show is realistic, we know that it's telling the truth about how things really are. A second definition from George Parsons Lathrop uh, says that realism uh, considers characters and events which are apparently the most ordinary and uninteresting in order to extract from these their full value and true meaning. Uh, Lathrop is reminding us that realism looks deeper into things that seem really plain in order to find their meaning. Note the word ordinary here. That word's going to come up again and again in the next few minutes. One last definition more recently. A scholar, Amy Kap Kaplan, wrote that realism is a strategy for imagining and managing the threats of social change. So in other words, a lot of the fiction that survives from that time is looking at how to deal with these big social issues of the day. Okay, so let's look at some characteristics and techniques of literary realism. Now, I'm about to go over some generalizations. Not all realistic fiction did the same thing, and we will also see that some of what I'm going to talk about applies to literature from other periods as well. But generally, these are some of the things that you can expect in the uh, realistic works that we'll be reading. First, uh, a major subject in these works is the complex ethical choices that characters face. Uh, 
uh, Huck Finn in Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain is a perfect example of this. And in the scenes that you'll be reading this week, he has to face a really difficult decision about what to do about his friend, Jim, who is a slave. He's been uh, raised to believe, Huck has been raised to believe that slavery is uh, the correct way to do things. And so he believes that what he should do is turn his friend, Jim, into the authorities. But his growing consciousness won't let him do that. Um, linear plots. In other words, plots begin at the beginning, they go through things chronologically, and they end at the end. Now that might sound obvious, right? But in the 20th century, authors begin to experiment with that, as we'll talk about later. Most importantly, the subjects and plots of realist works are ordinary. The things that happen in them realistically could, could probably happen to ordinary people. So we won't see any monsters being made out of human body parts. Um, we won't see anything like that. Okay, next, the characters in realist fiction. There's that word ordinary again. Realist fiction tells stories about ordinary people, often they're middle or working class characters. And these characters are studied in depth. In fact, uh, often the characters in realist fiction are more important than plot. Who they are is more important than what's happening. These characters act on their environment. Remember how I said that a subject, a common subject is the moral choices, the complex choices that characters make. These characters have to consider how to act on their environment and then they do. Settings. Uh, again, there's that word ordinary. These works take place in ordinary places and they are immediate. In other words, they are set in the present day. They did not, like the Romantics, tend to uh, set their works uh, in a historical period previous to when it was being written and they didn't, like science fiction writers might today, use future settings. The settings were in the here and the now. The language that authors used. Again, ordinary language. To us it might not seem so ordinary because the language changes. The vocabulary that we use might change, so you might find yourself needing to look up words in the dictionary. But for, for writers of the late 1800s, they were using ordinary language. The narrators tended to be objective, um, using ordinary diction. By objective, I mean that they didn't necessarily comment on what they were writing about like Harriet Beecher Stowe did in her novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, where she kept commenting on how evil slavery was. Instead, the narrators in realist works let uh, the action and the characters speak for themselves. When their characters use dialogue, when the characters speak to each other, they would be true to how ordinary people would speak. They used vernacular and dialect sometimes. In other words, they tended to use conversational language and slang. Twain was a master of dialect, so you'll notice that he has both Huck and Jim speak in dialects. The purpose. Realist writers generally wanted to teach us a lesson. They had a moral that they wanted to communicate about some big issue that was happening around them, perhaps. The word that we use for this is didactic. Realist literature had a didactic purpose. In other words, it wanted to instruct, to teach. Realist writers also wanted to explore the value and meaning of ordinary life in America. And finally, of course, they wanted to entertain. Let's look at some key figures. The authors that we're going to look at this semester include Mark Twain, Henry James, uh, the master of psychological realism, which we'll talk about next week, uh, Mary Louise Wilkins Freeman, who you probably haven't heard of, but who was a big name in her time, uh, and, and Bret Hart, another one, as well as other writers that are on the syllabus. Okay, so to recap what we've been talking about, in the literature before this class starts, uh, before the Civil War, um, uh, we have Romanticism. Realism starts in the late 1800s after the Civil War, 1865 to 1900 or so. While romantic literature featured improbable plots that were unlikely to happen to people in real life, the realist authors featured ordinary plots, ordinary things that might feasibly happen. 
The Romantics put their, uh, set their literature in faraway places and faraway times, but the Realists use ordinary, immediate settings. The Romantics tended to use heightened language with idealized individuals, while the Realists tended to use ordinary language and ordinary characters. See that word ordinary over and over again? And then finally, realists had a didactic purpose. They wanted to instruct. This week and next, we'll be looking also at, at relatives or forms of realism. A couple of the authors on our reading list, you'll read more about this in the packet, uh, this week are regionalist writers. Regionalism is like realism um, with a special attention to the region in which it was written. Regionalist writers uh, were concerned that their own ways of life were dying and they wanted to preserve them. Sort of like how we sometimes worry that the local mom and pop stores are getting replaced by Walmart and McDonald's. So these writers paid particular attention to the setting, to the features of that setting, that location that were specific uh, to that geographical area, usually rural. Uh, and typically there was a positive relationship between the characters and the setting. We'll look at examples this week. Okay, next week we'll be looking at two other forms of realism called psychological realism, which basically pays attention to the mental processes of a character to their interior minds, and naturalism which we'll describe next week as realism plus Darwin. It's sort of a darker look um, at these characters. So this week, just a few reminders. First of all, read the assigned texts carefully using the reading guide for this week. Don't forget to look up words in dictionary if you need to. See all the deadlines in the schedule. When you uh, are looking at the discussions, make sure to read everybody's posts. This is where we will replicate a classroom discussion and I'll want you to get multiple viewpoints on the literature that we're reading from your classmates and from me. Um, most importantly, enjoy the literature. Soak it all in. If you don't get every little detail at first, uh, don't worry about that. You can ask questions later, but try to enjoy what these authors are telling us. That's it for now. I'll see you on the discussions.